Hello everyone and welcome to the Alum Fellows Reading Series here at the Du Bois Institute at Harvard's Hutchins Center for African and African American Research. Today, Adulu Bitang will present his work in progress. Formerly a joint Hutchins and Safra Center Fellow, he is now a postdoc fellow at the Edwin J. Safra Center for Ethics at Tel Aviv University. After Dr. Bitang reads from his work, he will be engaged in conversation by Mark Delancey, Professor and Chair at the Department of History of Art and Architecture at DePaul University. And afterwards, the conversation will be opened up to questions from the audience. So would you like to begin, Dr. Bitang? Thank you, Krishna, for your presentation. And thank you for having me for this Alum Fellow uh, reading um, series. As you say, I'm going to read a work in progress. So let's try to start directly right now. So the Nafum tool enables to avoid two pitfalls about African art. First, it turns its back to the traditional approach that would like to situate African art, especially pre-colonial in relation to Western colonialism, or more precisely pre-museum art in the continuity of the primary interest of Westerners for African masks. The fact that is, it is in itself brought to light, that is to say exhibited at the Royal Museum of Fumban testifies to only one part of the history, its, muse its museumization being the result of the desire to preserve the memory of the Bamum people. Moreover, the copy that is exhibited there has more of a historical value than an aesthetic value, like all the artifacts in the museum. This Royal Museum of Fuban not being the result of a desire for artification, but the result of a desire for conservation. In other words, the primary interest of the artifacts that made up its collection is historical rather than aesthetics. In this sense, this tool bears no resemblance to the many objects stolen by Westerners and Western states and display more or less victoriously around the world. If the Royal Museum of Fumban does not play a role of artification, this is hardly a defect. On the contrary, this is all its interest, since it seems to preserve the works it exhibits as they are, as such, so to speak, without changing, the, changing their nature, while the exhibition of a funerary mask in a Western museum, for example, detaches this object from its context of enunciation, which is also that of its production and somewhat, so to speak, of its reception where it is no longer seen for what it is because it is now seen. Still, there is obviously an aesthetic interest in exhibiting the Nafum stool at the Royal Museum of Fumban, but this is possible, but it is, it is possible to consider that this interest is only collateral in relation to the primary interest of the conservation of the museum whose purpose is historical. In this sense, the historical conservation stems from the aesthetic interest in the object. In addition, the accidentally autistic masks were originally objects of worship. That is to say, they were marked with a seal of religiosity or the, or the appearance of the magical word, which served to defend the idea of the fundamentally religious nature of the Negro, as well as the idea of a duality between the religious value and the value of exhibition as Walter Benjamin argued. By being originally a royal article, the Nafum stools contradicts these two categorizations in which it is customary to enclose art and black art. Indeed, this tool presents itself directly as a political object, that is to say, as an object freed from the influence of magic and religion. In this sense, it is directly autonomous from the latter two practices. And as a political object, it is to be compared to courtly art, which is the first step toward the autonomy of autonomous art, according to Peter Berger. This author argues courtly art is a transition between sacred art and bourgeois art properly autonomous. But one can go further. Berger defines autonomous art as, I quote, the objectification of the self-consciousness of the bourgeois art, the bourgeois class 
end quote. This, definish, this definition applies exactly to the determined social function of the NAFOM stools with the proviso that one accepts in the absence of bourgeoisie in the context referred to here to substitute this social category for royalty. Now, it appears that courtly art obviously fulfilled this bourgeois function of art that is autonomy insofar as it is, has precisely no other goal than to stage the royalty that it represents. In this sense, that is to say, insofar as it is authentically royal, this art is also authentically autonomous, royalty being conceived here as a subject of art that can validly be defined as the domain based on the imaginary and supported by reality in which the self-consciousness of the Bamum royal class is objectified. Challenging this affirmation, Bouguer could probably argue that with regard to the three ways in which art is appreciated as a practice, namely purpose of function, production and reception, courtly art fails to fulfill the requirement of individuality which sanctions autonomy. In fact, Bouguer would contend that if the purpose function of the artistic practice in court context is to produce representational objects, which is a big step compared to, uh, which is a big step compared to toward the autonomy of art in comparison with sacred art. And if the production of works of art is itself lived subjectively in the sense that it establishes the artist as an individual creator, the last condition with regard to the autonomous, that is individual reception of art is not satisfied to the extent that, quote, the reception of courtly art remains collective, although the context of the collective performance has changed, end quote. Whereas in sacral art, the content of the reception of artworks is collective and linked to religion, uh, the court in courtly art, the content of the reception of artworks, although it remains collective, it's now concerned with sociability. Unfortunately, Berger is not specific on what to understand by this latter term. To grasp a sense is by to grasp a sense of what is meant by the author, we need to compare it with what Berger holds as the content of the reception of artworks in the bourgeois society. In this context, writes Berger, quote, a, dec a decisive change sets in, namely the reception by isolated individuals, end quote. This is finally where bourgeois art, properly autonomous, radically differs from courtly art and even more radically, again, from sacral art. In this sense, my claim that the Nafon stool can be appreciated from the perspective of its aesthetic, remarkably decorative properties seems groundless since courtly art of which this tool is a representative fails to satisfy the requisites of autonomy and is thus fatally linked to the practice of life from which derive its purpose, function, meaning, and significance. In short, as it is only with regard to the food and concrete autonomy where purpose, function, production, and reception are free of any other social concerns than autonomy itself, that, work, uh, that artworks can manifest to the highest possible sense their aesthetic character, the latter flourishing in bourgeois society with aestheticism, namely the situation in which art is to art its own content. As convincing as it may seem, this approach to art is far from being flawless. The main shortcoming of Petersburger argument is the ideological content of his notion of the autonomy of art. Although his definition of autonomy as, quote, apartness from praxis of life, end quote, is necessary for the construction of his general Manichaean view of art, and in particular for his interpretation of the avant-garde as opposed to bourgeois art, it is nonetheless troubling that Berger does not pay much attention to the connection between autonomous art and the bourgeoisie. To this extent, his account of the autonomy of art falls under the Marxian critique of ideology namely the, obscurity, the obscuring of reality. The reason for this is simple and lies in the fact that no matter how one approaches this concept, one discovers that the autonomy of art has always been closely related to society. In fact, 
art can only be said autonomous in so far as it is, as it is interested in society. And this explains what's, why Bürger can locate the autonomy of art in the bourgeois society, which is a way of saying that the alleged autonomy of the artistic, artistic practice is a feature of the bourgeois society itself. In this light, it appears that autonomous art is no stranger to the functioning of, of the bourgeois society and does not stand apart from its practice of life. Rather, as noted by Bürger, who is unfortunately reluctant to consider all the consequences of his description, autonomous art is actually interested in the portrayal of bourgeois self-understanding, which means it is interested in the process of life in the bourgeois society. From this, it appears that the bourgeois claim of the autonomy of art with this idea of autonomy pointing to the disinterest of art from the practical life of the society is from the very beginning an ideological claim whose purpose is to obscure the intimate connection between art and the bourgeoisie. And the most basic interest of the rising bourgeoisie as a dominant social class in Europe was to assert and maintain its newly acquired hegemony. To this end, the portrayal of the bourgeois life was never a neutral act, disinterested in society and concerned only with what art for the arts, for the sake of art. Therefore, the purpose function of autonomous art in the bourgeois societies is highly social and political, since it is wholly integrated as a sub-institution into the social institution that is the bourgeoisie. As such, autonomous bourgeois art is part of the praxis the life practice of bourgeoisie of the end of bourgeois society, just as, quote, courtly art is part of the life praxis of courtly society, and just as sacred art is part of the life praxis of the faith, end quote. The idea of praxis of life is used by Bürger as a proviso to detaching, for detaching the interest in aesthetics from which art stems as a domain that is separated from the practical interest in living. Bürger, who understands to some extent the ideology behind the idea of autonomy of art, notably the assertion that, quote, the, relation, the relative dissociation of the work of art from the practice of life in bourgeois society thus becomes transformed into the erroneous idea that the work of art is totally independent of society, end quote, uses the expression praxis of life in a way that detaches aesthetic, that is autistic interest from the interests of the individual. However, what Burger's conception of autonomy fails to capture is the fact that even in a bourgeois society, art continues to play, quote, a direct social role, end quote, which is to participate in the reproduction of bourgeoisie itself. To this extent, if bourgeois art is no longer directly involved in science or morality, and is therefore no longer integrated in the practice of life at the individual level, it is nevertheless intimately tied to the practice of life of the bourgeoisie consider as its subject and its social justification. Its direct social role is the reproduction of the bourgeoisie itself, but by which it is unavoidably integrated into the practice of life, not of the bourgeois individual, Burgess right on this point, but of the very social class that is bourgeoisie. The author who contends that Kant in his appreciation of the universality of the aesthetic judgment, quote, closes his eyes to the particular interests of his class, end quote, does the same regarding the categorization of the autonomy of art. Here, Bürger offers the reader a refreshed variation of Kant's alleged impartiality, as the autonomy of art is associated with the renunciation of to all direct intervention in reality, the so-called praxis of life. This ultimately explains why Berger proves himself incapable of uncovering the ideological character behind aestheticism, namely the person which culminates, according to him, the idea of autonomy of art in the bourgeois society. A second noticeable shortcoming of Berger's argument, closely related to the one identified above, concerns his idea that the reception of works of art is an individual act performed by, quote, isolated individual, here, end quote. Here again, Bürger, who recognizes that art is an institution, is nevertheless blind to the consequences of this situation on the inevitable social character of the experience of art. In fact, since the precondition for the appreciation, production, and reception of art is the existence of society itself, the relation to a work of art is never an isolated act insofar as art itself is, by its very nature, a mediated 
practice that is created and appreciated collectively. This, of course, does not mean that the creator is not an individual. However, as they work with an absolutely mediated material, whether, be it, whether it be the forms, the colors, sound, etc., the production of art is unavoidably a social practice that is performed individually. On the other hand of the spectrum, namely that of the reception of art, this observation remains valid because the appreciation of art presupposes an adequate education, which can be properly achieved in society only. In this regard, the experience of art might appear at first sight as an individual act. In fact, it is only subjective, which is different from being individual. And by subjective, I mean that it implies the personal or private capacities, notably the senses and the education of the individual. Therefore, the appreciation of art is also social practice, but performs subjectively. But performs subjectively. Again, this speaks of the mediated character of art by which it belongs to the society, but strive to operate as if it was different from it. This particular situation, rather from being a defect to be corrected, is exactly what makes art, works of art, artists, and the corresponding philosophical reflection of them special in a sense that allows to speak of their autonomy. In this respect, Adorno's remark concerning the lyrical eye at work in the work of art that finally speaks of a we are far more superior to Berger's remarks about the so-called individual appreciation of art, which, express, uh, which expresses a bourgeois ideology. To the very end of his progressive character, the bourgeois demand for beauty, which crystallizes in the doctrine of La Poula, reverses into its complete opposite, namely the political reaction and cifred in the concept of a disinterest pure, to speak the language of Kant, exclusively self-sufficient artwork. This ideology, which is in fact that of the autonomy of art, responds to and accompanies the other ideology of the self-sufficient subject who experiences art. These two claims rejoin and form the ideological core of Burger's theory and the historicism it inherits from Walter Benjamin. But in the context offered by the Nafam Stools, Benjamin's theory of the, of the history of the work of art is reversed because the political option of art that he conceived as the last stage of the evolution of the work appears here as one of the first moments of his existence by which via the staging of their powers, which is especially domination on subjects, the dominant classes liberate the cultural magic and usual objects of their primary significance to open them to the world of the presentation of oneself having to found, to remind or to strengthen their authority. Unlike Benjamin, the political interest of the work of art does not look at the side of the establishment of a society of judges. This audience to which he attributes a critical power related to its power of appreciation. It resides rather in the secularization of the old mythical power, magic and religious, to which the dominant class reaches in order to legitimize their domination. The first political power of art appears here in the prolongation of the mythical seduction where it is to link as in the primitive word to fear and to wonder. The aesthetic interest of the Nafam stool betrays this link which unites in the relational word founded on the political community, art and domination. This particular connection absent in Berger's theory and romanticized, romanticized to some extent in Benjamin's theory relates to the bourgeois character of their respective approaches. Finally, the Nafam stool highlights another aspect of African art traditionally neglected or approached in a manner very close to mere craftsmanship. And even when they are considered as art, cult artifacts sometimes draw their aesthetic legitimacy from their political function, which is in a sense an incongruity, since one should be able to admit that the domains of the two disciplines, that is art and politics, are distinct, unless one can show, as attempted above, that it is possible for them to come together in the idea of power, art being thought of as having to accompany the political domination of a class that it then stages through representation. In this perspective, the artifacts from the royalty are indeed objects presentifying the power, 
but they are especially as the desired versions of this power, which carry it out of the only political sphere to make it enter in the imaginary where they extract themselves from the unique principle of functionality. The domination becomes sublimated. It is not exercised any longer directly, but from now on indirectly by diverted means, means ways by which it is more convenient to accept it. Such is the political interest of aesthetics rightly deplored by Benjamin for the reason that it plays the game of reification. The concept of beauty reaches here its most corrosive expression since it is so it, it is to it that belongs the heavy task to camouflage the ugliness that secretes aesthetically the artistic objects that bear a political connotation. The harmony that it presents as balance of forms and colors or still as control and of petulance intends to transport in the field of the imaginary and at the same time subjective and collective the relative harmony of the society of which it will be only the representation in terms of a language of the semblance aiming at the disinterested satisfaction. Such is, in the end, the last aesthetic interest of the Nafon stool, and more generally of courtly art, in that it rests on beauty, that is to say, on plenitude of force and power and harmony. The interest of, is to be linked to politics, not in the sense that aesthetics derives from this function, but in a symbolic sense where it refers indirectly to the pacification of society. That is to say, to the preservation of the latter on the grounds of its beauty. In that, the Nafom stool is eminently part of the decorative arts and can indeed undergo the criticism that Dono addresses to such a category of work, notably the claim that the decorative character moves away from the interiority of the work that is to say, from the political and social conditions that make it possible as an object of aesthetic appreciation. Here, the domination of a part of the population on another. In this light, Adorno's critique of Bamun, Bamun art, Adorno's critique hits Bamun art hard, and the Nafom stool is no exception. My intention, however, is to draw attention to another situation. Adorno argued that the, the the curative function was posterior to the properly artistic and aesthetic function, precisely as a degeneration of the latter. In other words, the decorative function of the work is fundamentally opposed to the aesthetic function that it downgrades below the power of art to signify. What I want to argue is that in the context of the Nafom stool, this situation can be appreciated differently. Here, the aesthetic function is a product of the ornamental character rather than the symptom of its decline. And I will stop there. Thank you. Um, Professor Delancey, there you are. Hi, thank you. And, and thank you for, uh, to Krishna and to uh, Tom and the Hutchins Center for inviting me to participate in this. And thank you to Dr. Adalu Batang for the the wonderful paper and making me think in new ways. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm an art historian, not a philosopher, so I might approach this from a little different perspective. Uh, but I hope that uh, I can, uh, you know, probe the ideas a little bit, push them around, and produce some 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 thoughts for us to discuss. So I've pre I've prepared some some uh, something to 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 read more or less and uh, and then scribbled notes all over of course as well uh, so when I present that and then uh, we can um, open up to discussion so uh, I, I guess my first uh, question um, uh, in reading this uh, paper is the degree to which the aesthetic theory both of Adorno and, and Berger um, are relevant to all art versus um, simply this idea of bourgeois or autonomous art or um, abstract art, uh, various terms are used at different times, I think. Um, are they describing a historical process that's specific to European art and particularly modern European art, or um, is it a more universal theory? Um, so the necessity of uh, substituting the term royal for bourgeois at some point in this uh, essay 
um, due to the lack of a Bamun bourgeoisie, suggest the theories are in some way inappropriate for the subject of the Nafam stool. Um, if it is to be taken as a universal, then um, is this possible only by ignoring art and aesthetic theory from elsewhere, such that the European becomes the universal to which all others are subjugated? And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, there's a wonderful exhibition on at the Art Institute of Chicago uh, right now on aesthetics in African art, which I am yearning to get to. I haven't had the opportunity yet, but um, simply the, the idea that there are other aesthetic theories. Um, So, um, and I worry that by imposing a set of criteria um, appropriate for contemplating the trajectory of European modern art upon a Bamun art, of, art form that was really never intended as participating in that trajectory, that, uh, um, that it'll always draw up short, uh, and that in effect we're in some way recolonizing Bamun art. Uh, is is a fear uh, of mine, and that's not to say that we can't apply or you know look at the application of European aesthetic theories to African art. Of course, we can. Uh, I just think it needs adequate uh, or or some serious qualification, right? On on what works, what doesn't, and why. Um, and it's not just social class that's being um, replaced here by royal class, um, but also the entire societal structure that dictates aesthetic production. Um, so that is Adorno and Berger considering a late capitalist model in which industry produces both the aesthetic object um, and trains the audience, right, or the consumer uh, to desire that object or to appreciate and desire that, that, that work. Um, Adorno and Benjamin uh, seem more interested in the mass reproduction of works of art and that reduce an intellectual gesture to a stylistic commodity. Um, and in the potential for that work to either gloss over the imposition of capitalist control over individuals or alternatively to mobilize the masses, as uh, Benjamin uh, suggests. Um, but in the Bumun case, rather uh, than capitalist producers, we're talking about a royal ruling class who are commissioning objects to aestheticize the act of holding power and resources. And um, are these sufficiently similar cases to speak of in the same breath? You know, um, how, do, how do we? How do we apply the theory and yet recognize the, the differences? Um, towards the end of the paper, uh, the focus shifts. Well, actually, this is a part of the paper you didn't you didn't present, so maybe I shouldn't go to it. But I was going to talk about, uh, in, in the end of the paper, you, you talk about the shifting from the stool itself to the act of sitting and the performative aspects of, exactly. of, of power and of the, the stool. Um, which got me to thinking, you know, oh my gosh, what is the work of art? Is it the stool anymore, or is it the performance um, uh, uh, and that that uh, is, the, or both? Maybe it's both, right? Uh, in different circumstances, um, and, and I think opens the broader question of the context of engagement, right? Um, can the context in which we encounter the thing transform the value of the thing? Um, so when it's placed in the museum, removing it from practical use, it takes on these historic and perhaps aesthetic values um, um, that are then replaced by a use value when the nafong sits upon it uh, in a ceremonial context. Um, and, and I think uh, there's also a question of the, the museum in which the stool is displayed, which uh, I think needs to be historicized and understood in a broader manner as well, right? The Bamun Palace Museum, um, has a variety of values, both in the present and in the past. And, and I think we're still exploring the, you know, the, how this museum was came into being and what it was meant to do, and why it was created and so on. Um, but uh, you know, today it's characterized primarily as historical in nature, right? Preserving the, the Bamun past, uh, the Bamun heritage. Uh, and of course, then all of the objects within it um, are transformed into a sort of uh, evidentiary objects of the pre-colonial past and the, the colonial past as well, right? Many of those objects were produced in the colonial era. Um, but that museum is also within a palace, <laughs> right? Uh, and um, so in that sense, it serves as a sort of continuous legitimation from the present backwards to the pre-colonial past or the you know, reverse either way um, of the ruler who's its owner and caretaker. 
Um, so it serves that very clear political role as well. Um, it serves religious and political functions. It's when the objects are removed from collections for employment and cer ceremonial occasions, right? Because it's the palace museum is a lending museum, right? Objects can be, in a sense, checked out uh, and then checked back in. Um, and, and as they're removed and employed in ceremonies, they're themselves changed. Uh, the objects are transformed to some extent. Um, so if they're preserved, they're preserved not uh, in necessarily the exact same state. Um, and, and so I was going to, here, I, I want to give an example of what I'm talking about. Because I'm an art historian, I like my PowerPoints. <laughs> uh, let me uh, share my screen here for a second. So um, first of all, just to give uh, an idea of, uh, and I hope this is showing up properly, uh, to give an idea of uh, the stool as it might be perceived in, in action, right, uh, in its use function. But here, um, these are a couple of images from uh, 2014. Uh, I was in uh, Fumban uh, for the uh, Nguan uh, ceremonies biannual, uh, 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 this event that occurs every two years to sort of renew the relationship between ruler and population. Uh, and I had gone into the museum the, you know, a couple of days before, and I'd seen right, these wonderful staffs uh, with beaded finials and uh, this mass of tangled iron around the base. And they're, I don't know if beautiful is the right word, but fascinating and, and mesmerizing, I think, are perhaps more appropriate terms. There's aspects of beauty, but they're also aspects that, that push you away a little bit, but they're, they're fascinating objects. And I saw them in their vitrines in the palace museum and so on. And then uh, during the Nguan ceremony, they're brought out uh, into this public square and you can see the masses of people around uh, as these uh, individuals are, uh, are, are speaking uh, of, um, um, you know, presenting the, the ceremony. Uh, and then, um, you know, there's a, a moment when uh, they say, uh, okay, we're all good Muslims and Christians now, so this is purely a cultural act, um, has no religious content, and then they cut the throat of this goat and spilled its blood upon each of the objects. And, you know, it's kind of, you know, thou doth protest too much, you know, I'm sure there's nothing, <laughs> nothing religious in that act. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, after this spilling the blood upon the objects and so on, then they're placed back in the museum. And so the next day, uh, you know, I, I went back to the, uh, uh, to the, the museum and here are these same objects, but with congealed blood on, on the, the tangled iron now. And so they've been transformed. They've been transformed physically, right? With the addition of new materials, they've been transformed uh, in a more religious sense by the empowering of the objects through the spilling of life force upon them. Um, they've been transformed in terms of their political role for a moment, and now they're back as historical and perhaps aesthetic objects uh, in the museum. So there's these, these um, radical shifts that, that occur that I, I, I think is important to keep in mind. Um, right. Um, so, and I, and I would argue that, that, you know, one value is not destroyed by another. Uh, it's simply that we have this shifting uh, of values. Uh, and, and in talking about the pitfalls of African art and this, this idea that the field of African art uh, has been formed around the idea that objects are primarily religious, that's, I'm not sure that that's the pitfall as, long, as much as it is that the field was formed around the idea that that's the only meaning, right, or the only value, but that there are in fact these other values that accrue also. Uh, and that as one comes into focus, maybe another fades into the background, but the, they can fade back into the foreground again as that context um, changes. Um, right, uh, and, and so, um, so likewise with the Nafam stool, again, a part of the paper that, that you didn't present, but, uh, but that I, I keyed into immediately because you started talking about at the end about the actual materials that are employed in the formation of the Nafam's stool, cowrie shells that could be used as currency in one context, that, but that are destroyed, that, that 
currency, uh, that employment as currency is sort of destroyed when they're applied to the NAFOM stool. But of course, they could always be pried back off and use <laughs> pressed back into, into their role as currency if, if so desired and if we still used calories as currency. Um, so, so um, right, uh, and, and coming back to the museum and the very various contexts that, that, or the various contexts and readings of the objects within the museum, uh, you know, if we look in the past and at the formation of that collection, it was, of course, the first museum in Cameroon formed by King Enjoya himself, the, the King of Bamun, uh, in the early 20th century. Um, and, you know, uh, scholars are now looking at that formation as a reaction to the imposition of colonial rule and the stripping away of aspects of the king's power and authority um, at the time that it was formed. Um, there was a bitter rival in town, this fellow named Mose uh, Yeyap, uh, who was uh, forming an artist collective uh, and commissioning objects himself from artists um, that he would uh, sell, then sell on to French colonial purchasers, right? Um, uh, and the, these operations eventually evolved into what's now the Rue des Artistes, the, the, the Artist Road, and the uh, Musée des Arts et Traditions, the, the Museum of Arts and Traditions in, in Bamoun. There's, there's two museums. Um, and, and this set up, set up a rivalry um, designed to serve the burgeoning tourist industry and, and the formation of uh, and, and, and art collectors who were buying up these objects. So Yeyap was the fulcrum of this relationship between French colonials and Bamoun artists. And in that role, he was in effect usurping the role of the king, right? Usurping the role of the king as primary art patron, as owner of artistic objects, uh, as the wealthiest and most influential individual in the, war, in the area. Um, here's this rival coming up. And so in this model of events, the formation of this palace museum, the placement of all of these objects within is not only historical, but it takes on aspects of a sort of political and class struggle that's going on in this colonial context that I think could enrich this whole discussion a little bit. Uh, uh, and, and a struggle for control over aesthetic production. Um, and then, you know, finally, I, I think one of the the trajectories taken in this presentation that I, I, I think is a, a fascinating one and, and I would love to see elaborated more um, is, um, is sort of aimed in the other direction, right? At Berger and Adorno on this whole idea of art for art's sake or autonomous art or whatnot, um, sort of exposing the myth of that, which, which I think you embark on, um, but I think could be built out, right? Um, um, uh, pointing out that that there's a myth at play here in this art for art's sake idea that art uh, as a product of and engage with society must have a social role um, and can never in a sense attain that Kantian idea, Kantian idea of the, the purely aesthetic divorced of all other values, right? Um, uh, the, the, you start down that road, but, but sort of pull back a little bit. Um, and, and it seems to me the argument uh, that's being made about the Nefam school that it, uh, stool, that it can be criticized as a functional object, playing the role of staging Bamun royalty, um, that that's the, 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 this principal criticism, but that modern art in Europe, or so-called art for art's sake, plays a similar, similar role in staging bourgeois identity. Um, but I'm not quite sure how that works. Um, that that wants spelling out, right? Uh, at one point, you uh, Berger, you, you reference Berger in stating that the auton that autonomous art is actually interested in the portrayal of bourgeois self understanding. Uh, at another point, that its direct social role is to participate in the reproduction of the bourgeoisie itself. But I, I'm not understanding what exactly that means. How that how that works. Um, is it the idea that um, uh, autonomous art um, portrays um, is functional in a sense that it can be bought and sold or invested in as a commodity, as, as a thing, uh, as, as uh, a holder, a bearer of value? It's, is it the fact that um, the display of the work of art 
uh, is a sort of conspicuous consumption in the same way that cowrie shells encrusted on the Nafam stool are? Um, is it a sort of function of demonstrating taste, right? Uh, um, you know, if you can appreciate this work of abstract art, then you are one of us, so you at least aspire, aspire to be one of us. Um, or is it some other way of staging the bourgeoisie that the, uh, in the same way that the Nafam stool does? Uh, and, and ultimately, is it, uh, you know, you argue at some point that it's not just that symbolizing power is not enough, um, but um, was it, what is it not enough for? Is it the idea that the, the stool as well as bourgeois art is um, creating, right? Uh, creating power, that it's not simply representing or symbolizing power, but actually making power happen, making it, making it. Um, so those are, I don't know, maybe I've misunderstood lots of things, <laughs> or maybe hopefully these are helpful ideas in, in pushing, um, pushing certain aspects of the, the essay, or at least providing things for us to discuss. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, for engaging with all this. So let me just reassure you, you didn't misunderstand anything. So everything was right. The comments were all, all right. The question also. So thank you very much for this feedback. And uh, well, I, I I don't think I can answer to all of your to all of your concerns. I mean, that's not a point, but definitely this gives me some. Um, some uh, good good points like to elaborate a little bit more and or to think more about it and or to connect a little bit more or to emphasize uh, some some claims uh so yeah definitely the there we have there we have so let me try to answer one of your last um worries uh about how is um the what is the, the staging of uh, bourgeoisie and how does that occur in the in the art to art and more more generally in in art as conceived as autonomous so what the and this claim is shared by all the philosophers of art like benjamin i've been drawing on three of them most uh, specifically here so benjamin adorno and buger they all agree on that so the autonomy is the fact that art, the practice of art is not linked, it's no longer linked to the, to the reproduction of society, that is to the, to the fulfillment of basic needs, uh, whether being uh, uh, primary needs uh, or more elaborated needs like religion or myth. So if, if a, an uh, uh, art is integrated in, a, in like magic, called uh, uh, religion, then it fulfills a kind of uh, uh, a function that is necessary for the reproduction of the individual within the society. So that is no longer necessary, according to them, when it comes to bourgeois, to bourgeois art, because definitely there's a separation between the spheres, different spheres of existence, namely art, which is kind of separated from and any other things that is practical. For example, science, which is kind of practical, religion, which is kind of practical also in, in another sense. So the very pos possibility for uh, uh, the discipline, that is aesthetics, and that is also what is claimed by Kant, and he's right in saying that, is the necessity for a specific domain to emerge as not directly linked to what is the everyday life. And those who are concerned with those uh, with this new domain are artists and the product of their work which is not directly in uh, interested in the life the current the everyday life of this of the, of the society is the, the work of art so the work of art is different that is why it's aesthetic it's, it's slightly different for the current staging the current reproduction that is the everyday life of the society but this it itself is ideological <laughs> because what when we look at uh, bourgeois art one of the the beginning of what it would be bourgeois art in the 
in the in Europe, by like the middle of the 19th century, was painting. And what were those people who were painting? What they were doing? They were painting life scenes. And who were the people portrayed? They were bourgeois. <laughs> and what was the life that was put in on stage? It was bourgeoisie. They were showing how bourgeois life is and we were participating in that, in the reproduction of the same class, in the idea that the ways of doing of bourgeoisie are the universal ways of doing. That happened in, the, in novel as well, that happened in painting, that happened in uh, almost everywhere in the arts. So there, there is a, a, an obvious limit to this idea that art can, is dissociated from the reproduction itself, that is from the very life of, of, uh, of the society but not from the individual itself. That's the difference. As an individual, we don't need to have any encounter with art. No, that's no longer needed if we're in the bourgeois society. However, for the very bourgeois society to establish itself as the only society relevant to, to uh, I mean, to, how can I put, to, to say what is good, what is bad, to establish a kind of standard of living, mm. art, art was really important for, for that. So definitely it participated in the staging of bourgeoisie as the subject of art, and also in its own setting and its own reproduction as the only relevant class uh, to be portrayed in the art. So even like people like Stendhal, who we were re realist, and this is something that has been highlighted by Adorno, the realism was in the beginning, the description of the bourgeois life. But the very uh, ingenuous, ingenuity of people like Stendhal was to portray different people than bourgeois. Mm. And that was the beginning of something that would lead in the 20th century to the, uh, the avant-garde. But from the very beginning, the bourgeois art was politically uh, uh, interested in the reproduction of bourgeoisie. So the same goes also for, um, for the Bamun. But you're right, there is no uh, bourgeoisie, Bamun bourgeoisie. So how am I, how do I allow myself to transpose without any medium the theory of uh, Adorno and uh, Benjamin and Bouguer uh, that primarily, primarily applies to the European content? Well, it's because all these theories have um, secret uh, um, uh, a philosophy of history to explain what art has become. And there is no way for art to go back. So the, the evolution of art comes from primitivism to more uh, develop, uh, uh, to a more developed existence and then ends in the bourgeoisie and then reverse with a post, post post uh, everything we have right now, like postmodern and all, and so on and so on. But the very possibility to speak of art is the possibility of bourgeoisie. So everything that is not bourgeoisie is to be linked to the, to the previous existence of art. So is African art. That's, that's the, 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 the idea, underlying idea behind the, the, the history of, of art, which in itself, uh, leads to a, a philosophy of history with the evolution of, of art. So they may be talking about, in the first place, about European art, but since there's a philosophy of history that tends to apply universally, then they are not only talking about, universe, uh, about uh, European art, they are talking negatively about all the other art that have not undergone, that did not undergo the, the, the very same path that, uh, uh, that took the, the European art. And that's why I need to talk about them <laughs> because I don't think they're right. <laughs> so is it, is it, am I recolonizing the Bamun art? I don't think so. Actually, I'm, I'm decolonizing mm -hmm. the Bamun art. I'm providing new categories to, to have a different understanding of what art has become without the necessity to refer 
exclusively to the evolution of art in the European society and to try to provide a, a, a view of how without any kind of knowledge of what was going on in the other parts of the world in specific contexts, uh, my claim is just limited to the Bermoon art and to this specific object, as I explain why. You, you pointed other objects, but I'm not interested in them. I think that's very specific to the Nafum that I'm not sure we can apply it to all, all the other objects in the Royal Museum. So in the specific case of the Bamun art and in the specific case of the Nafum, there is something happening there. There's a possibility to read the history of art differently. And my very starting point with this was the idea of the courage, the decorative art, which is really, really criticized by Adorno as a regression of the aesthetic. And what I'm trying to say is to take to put upside down, <laughs> to put this claim upside down by saying, wow, look, if you look at the European art, of course, Adorno is right, but European art is not all. And we might have different stories told by different uh, evolutions, different, different people, different objects in the world that can, in a sense, help to put into in perspective what happened in, in Europe. So definitely, I don't think this is, I'm trying to recolonize the moon art. I'm trying to decolonize aesthetics and to, and to provide a different way of speaking about art that is not directly informed and directly narrowed to the only uh, European perspective, which is relevant. It is well described. That's correct. They all well describe how they, the evolution of art, but it doesn't fit all the, all the situation, especially it doesn't fit the Bermoon, uh, the Bermoon art. So um, yeah, sure. Uh, no, no bourgeoisie. Why do we? Do, why do I need then to talk about courtly art? Well, for the same reason that bourgeoisie is a is a is a step further on the ladder of uh, of the evolution of art according to these theoreticians. So if you don't have a bourgeoisie, then of course there's something that is missed in the, your very idea of art. There's something that is missed. You're stuck somewhere in the evolution. When we put this into in perspective with regard to the philosophy of history, that is underlying the, the, the only, their own history of art. And that's why exactly what I want to challenge. That's why I, I want to challenge. And uh, I'm not claiming it's we, we, we should think or we should say that uh, Bamoom uh, royal, royalty is bourgeoisie. I'm saying it functions in the absence of, of, a, of a bourgeoisie. We can see some of the functionings, some of the characteristics of uh, uh, bourgeoisie at play directly in what is called. So it's not a regression from the evolution of, of the society which led us to, to bourgeoisie in Europe. It's, it's this class in itself. Mm -hmm. And we, we don't need to try to make it happen uh, to try to, to to, to, to put it in perspective with the bourgeoisie, because in the, in the very, I, I, again, I'm, I need to go back to this idea of the evolution of art, the history of art, and the philosophy of history that is behind this idea. So if we say this is courtly art, and then we need to move forward to go to bourgeoisie, then of course you start somewhere in history. And then there's a need to civilize, to civilize you to all these things that have been legitimization for colonization. Well, I think we should stop. I think, I think we can stop there and try to explain what happened there and how it functioned. I'm interested in the functioning of this rather than trying to make it fit with the dominant bourgeois re recreation of a uh, history of art. So yes, this is a very, very uh, interesting question about the performance. So what is finally <laughs> autistic? Is it still the Nafum? Is it the, the Nafum stool? Is it the, is it the Nafum? Is it the Nafum sitting on the stool? Is it the stool in itself? Is it the stool exposed? Is it the stool in the museum? That's a complicated question. <laughs> so short, the short way to answer this is to say that the, perf the performance is in, is, uh, is you should uh, understand the performance in a holy, in a kind of holistic uh, 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 context where the performance cannot occur without the performer and without the object of performance, 
which makes us think differently also about what is a work of art. The work of art, is it the, 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 the stool that is the material? Is it the artist? Is it the, the action of this, the artist to sit? Like when I say the artist, I mean the NAFO, to sit on the, on the stool? When is there art in all these processes? There's an, there's an answer in the, in the conceptual art, for example, in the, in the, Western, uh, in the Western aesthetics. Like in postmodern aesthetics, like uh, in contemporary aesthetics, there is a possibility to have performance as a work of art in itself without the necessity of an, of an object. That was already anticipated. And that's what I'm trying to argue by to sh uh, trying to show how all these things interact to create the very possibility of aesthetic. And the last part of it is like, if we agree with all these things, then we should agree that there is a need to reform what is called aesthetics. We can't continue with the idea of aesthetics from how it arose from the uh, uh, speculations of the of Germans, Germans uh, philosophers and uh, British philosophers in by the middle of the 16th century. They had a very idea of what is aesthetics, but I think with this idea of the Nafum Su, again, this doesn't apply to all the objects in the museum <laughs> at all. It's just I, I, there's a focus on Nafum still. Aesthetics is more linked to what Rancière called in a book published in 20, in, uh, in the 2000, a Fabrique du Sensible, the, 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 the regime. Aesthetics is a way of presenting, of presenting things such as, to, in, such as they, uh, so that they appear mm. as work of art. The, the very way of presenting things that is what is aesthetics. And that is exactly what the NAFOM stores, uh, uh, NAFOM store, uh, uh, make per, uh, allow us to, to capture this very new idea, renew actually, idea of aesthetics. But we, in, in, in aesthetics literature, we have to work for, to wait for Rancière by the beginning of the 21st century. Why <laughs> during colonization in the 19th century in Africa, people already knew that what is aesthetics is especially the way of presenting things. And this very uh, uh, example of the Nafum stool allow us to, to capture it and to witness this very idea of aesthetic, quite different from how aesthetics has been practiced by philosophers and by artists, by critis, uh, uh, critics for ages. So uh, I guess that is, that is what I, I could say from uh, for, for to, to respond in a in kind of response to, to your feedback. There are other things that I, I, I need to, to take and to, to try to work a little bit on that. Uh, uh, for example, the relation of the with of art with politics. Uh, definitely uh, there's something I should say probably a little bit more, but also, you know. I'm limited by the paper. I'm trying to write a paper, not a book. <laughs> and this happens to me all the time because I start and then I'm like, oh no, I need to say more about this. <laughs> I need to say more about that. <laughs> and in the end, they will, they will remind me that, oh, you went, I don't know, you went too far. You need to cut it. <laughs> so definitely, you're right. You're right uh, about the political significance and the political uh, interactions of different functions of the work of art, definitely this is something more can be said about that. Uh, yeah, but yeah, let's keep in touch and see where it goes, all these reflections. Uh, uh, I really appreciate that you took the time to read this, the, the paper, even though it's a work in progress and uh, I'm looking forward to more feedback from you. Thank you so much. Well, actually what you've just said brought, brought to mind another question or idea about the stool and the nafam, this idea of you know, the stool becomes part of this larger performance. And, you know, that, that the nafom of, in effect becomes a sort of artist or a performance artist in the in this practice. And, and I wonder if it can't be reversed also in that uh, the nafom is in some way um, attains, it, it, it attains a status by virtue of the stool itself, that the stool invests the nephilim rather than the nephilim investing the stool with meaning. Um, well, actually you're right because the nephilim is nephilim, but that is, I don't think it's aesthetic. 
it's more like political because the Nafam, because Nafam, from the moment when she sits on the stool, but that is political. I'm interested just in the aesthetic, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the aesthetic like functioning of, of the object. Of course, we can't uh, dissociate the, the, the different functions as like building a bridge, uh, building a wall between the two. It's, it's hard to do, but I'm specifically interested in that. But you're right, politically, the Nafon becomes a Nafon when she sits on the throne and she is affected by the throne that rather than her affecting, affecting the still. Thank you so much. This is a fascinating discussion on philosophy, artistry, performance, aesthetics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna. And thanks for having me. <laughs> yes. Thank you both. Thank you.